Ecuador Citizen Revolution Movement's Luisa Gonzalez has become the only woman to win the first round of a presidential election and will face businessman Daniel Novoa in the country's runoff. In Niger, the United Nations Children's Fund warns that more than 2 million children are in need of humanitarian aid. And in South Africa, all is set in Johannesburg for the 15th BRICS Summit, where the Sumton Convention Center will host the leaders of the member states from Tuesday. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In a historic event in Ecuador, Luisa Gonzalez, candidate of the Citizen Revolution Movement, became the only woman to win the first round of a presidential election so far after Sunday's election day. With more than 92% of the votes counted, the candidate for the Citizen Revolution wins with 33.29% of the votes and will face the right-wing party Democratic Alliance led by the businessman Daniel Novoa in the runoff next October 15th. Novo obtained 23.67% of the votes. According to the National Electoral Council, 80% of the electoral roll participated in the election day, in a process marked by the inconvenience registered to exercise the vote abroad. The winner of the first round, Luisa Gonzalez, candidate of the Citizen Revolution, highlighted the historic fact that a woman was the winner history of Ecuador that a woman obtains such a high percentage in the first round, winning the election to be president of the Republic of Ecuador and lead the destiny of the country. Thank you very much to my beloved Ecuador. Thank you to the young people. Thank you to the women, to the men, to all those who have trusted in the citizen revolution and in Luisa Gonzalez. We are celebrating. There is no doubt. We are celebrating because we are making history, because although many of us have been made invisible, today we begin to mark a different history with faith, with hope and optimism. After learning the results, Daniel Novoa, senior candidate of the right-wing National Democratic Alliance, thanked for his ticket to the ballot. We have to start working again. We have to campaign again. There is a second round. We still did not achieve the objective, which is the presidency of the Republic. What we have done is to pass to the second round, for which I congratulate my team and I congratulate all the people who accompany me. And in this context, Ecuadorians also cast their votes on Sunday, opposing the oil drilling activities within a protected region in the Amazon in an unprecedented decision. This area is not only a sanctuary for two indigenous tribes living in isolation, but also a significant biodiversity hotspot. By early Monday, with over 90% of the votes counted, around 6 out of 10 Ecuadorians rejected the oil exploration in Block 44, which is situated within Yasuni National Park, a renowned global center of biological diversity. The region is home to the Tagaeri and Taramonani tribes, who choose to maintain their self-isolation. This historic referendum occurred concurrently with the presidential election, where the leftist candidate Luisa Gonzalez and the right-wing contender Daniel Boa proceed to a runoff. In Bolivia, President Luis Arce outlined the industrialization policy promoted by his government as an urgent need to guarantee food sovereignty. At the same time, an international economist described as successful the economic model that has been implemented in that country for more than 15 years. A correspondent, Freddy Morales, tells us more. Professor Gregorio Vidal from the Department of Economics of the Autonomous Metropolitan University of Itzapalapa, Mexico, commented the book A Fair and Successful Economic Model, The Bolivian Economy, 2006-2019, written by Bolivian President Luis Arce. There have been significant advances, and today we are in a context where it is not only a question of continuing to implement the model, but doing so in a context of complexities. Because on the one hand, it is necessary to rebuild what was destroyed in a short period of time when the will of the people was superseded. The Mexican professor stressed that economic models other than neoliberalism are also the result of social struggles and decisions of the peoples, and that the issue at stake is always the distribution of economic surplus. 
they are always social processes, never market processes. That is the tale they want to sell us. They want to sell us the idea that there are natural processes and those are markets. No, they're never natural processes. They are social processes. And there, in the case of neoliberalism, there are social processes so that the surplus goes to a few. President Luis Arce argued that the current economic model in Bolivia, which he promoted first as President Evo Morales' finance minister, now seeks industrialization, an unthinkable process in a neoliberal government. Neoliberalism had 20 years to industrialize the country, being one of the objectives that were set out. They never did it, and they are not going to do it, because as Professor Gregorio described, neoliberalism and the social elite that takes advantage and profits from neoliberal policies do not represent the Bolivian people, do not represent the most humble ones. President Arce pointed out that even the country's large agricultural producers use imported inputs, including seeds, which is why his administration aims to reverse this trend. The tomatoes that our comrades produce here in the countryside are grown with imported seed. So where does food security with food sovereignty stand? To talk of security with food sovereignty, we have to produce from the seed, and that is exactly what we're doing. The Bolivian model has been successful so far with economic stability for more than a decade which is evidenced, for example, by an inflation rate of 0.8% in the first half of this year. Freddy Morales, Telesur, Bolivia. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the south. In Spain, the Canary Islands President Fernando Clavijo said the fire rage in the island of Tenerife was intentional. The island official said in a press conference that what was initially a suspicion was finally corroborated by the investigations carried out by the Spanish Civil War. Clavijo assured that although the fire is not under control yet, the worst is over if no other unusual circumstances occur. He pointed out that some of the evacuees have been able to return to their homes since Sunday and more are expected to do so during the day. The acting Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez traveled on Monday to the island to visit the advanced command post and learn about the development of the firefighting activities. Minister Pedro Sanchez said on Monday that he hoped the wildfire that has forced thousands of people to evacuate on the holiday island of Tenerife will be stabilized in the coming days. The blaze broke out late Tuesday in a mountainous northeastern area, quickly morphing into the Canary Islands' biggest ever wildfire. Going on, I think that the next few hours will be very important. Let's hope that the weather will help us so that in the next few days, in the next few hours, we can consider the fire stabilized. Let's hope that the weather will be with us in this matter. I believe that at times like this, when we are witnessing the catastrophic power of the fire on the island of Tenerife, the civic commitment of the citizens as a whole is very important. And this is what we have been seeing since the beginning of this fire. I would therefore like to thank all the citizens of the Canary Islands, particularly those of Tenerife, and above all, the Spanish government's solidarity with those directly affected. The President of Chile, Gabriel, the constitutional state of catastrophe in several regions of central Chile. The regions of central Chile have been hit in recent hours by a powerful storm that has left at least two dead and tens of thousands evacuated. The president held an emergency meeting in the Maule region to closely monitor the situation and announce the measure in order to allow greater ease and flow of resources to respond to the emergency. The state of catastrophe extends from the regions of O'Higgins to Bio Bio, the worst affected by the storm. By way of a balance, I can tell you that, according to the latest figures from the Codric report, 
Today we regret the death of two people as a result of this rain front. A firefighter in Cañete and a case of a person who was hit by a tree last night. There are 804 victims, 416 sheltered. There are only in the mountain region more than 25,000 people isolated and we have more than 20,000 people evacuated at national level. In Russia, weather services reported record temperatures by registering on Sunday 38.4 degrees Celsius, the highest figure in 54 years. According to a statement issued by the Fobol Center, specializing weather information on Sunday's temperature is 0.4 degrees above the previous record of 1969. However, they warned that this figure could be exceeded at the end of the afternoon of Monday, reaching 39 degrees. On August 19th, the Weather Center issued a warning for the southeast of the country for temperatures that could reach 30 degrees Celsius, about 6 degrees above normal. In France, authorities activated the maximum heat wave alert level in several departments of the country due to temperatures expected between 40 and 42 degrees Celsius. Among those affected are the mountain of Mont Blanc and the wine region of the Rhone Valley, where some surrounding areas will be placed in the highest red alert category on Tuesday, given this. The Minister of Energy Transition, Christophe Bochou, explained that the decision was taken in view of the persistence of the heat wave and the country's temperatures. The government authorities are empowered to suspend or limit sporting competitions or festivals. And on Monday in Greece, a man was found dead in a fire northwest of Athens. A spokesman for the fire brigade said the elderly man, a shepherd trying to save his animals, had been caught in the flames. The fire forced the evacuation of two villages and some bathers from a nearby beach. Civil protection authorities have warned of an extreme risk of fires around Athens and in other parts of southern Greece. Meanwhile, 12 towns were evacuated over the weekend and seven firefighters and one volunteer were hospitalized with injuries. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you will be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. On Monday, the United Nations Children's Fund said that more than 2 million children are in need of humanitarian aid in Niger, a country that has been destabilized by a recent coup. Before the recent civil unrest and political instability in Niger, UNICEF already estimated that 1.5 million children under the age of 5 were suffering from malnutrition, of whom at least 430,000 were suffering from the deadliest form of malnutrition. According to UNICEF, these figures may increase if food prices continue to rise and an economic downturn hits families, households and incomes. In addition, electricity shortages affect the cold chain and can compromise the effectiveness of infant vaccines stored in health structures. The UN organization launches an urgent appeal to the actors of the crisis to grant access to Niger for humanitarian workers and supplies and ask donors to protect humanitarian funds from multilateral or unilateral sanctions. A convoy of around 300 supply trucks arrived in Niger's capital near May on Monday as Burkina Faso came to the aid of its sanctions hit neighbor. The West African bloc ECOWAS imposed sanctions on Niger after army officers toppled President Mohamed Bassoum in a coup last month. Benin and Nigeria closed their borders, disrupting supplies. The trucks sent by Burkina Faso's military rulers, mostly carrying food, were guarded by its army before Niger took charge of protecting them. The UN's food agency warned last week that sanctions and border closures linked to the political crisis were greatly affecting the supply of vital foods and medical supplies into Niger. Thanks God, Allah brought us home in good health. We left Abidjan, returned to Burkina in Kaya, and the convoy took us to Dori. From Dori, the Niger soldiers took us over to Terra, and from Terra to Niamey. In Hamdoliya, we had no problems. We're very grateful to the soldiers who escorted us. The convoy went very smoothly. 
They come from Burkina Faso and carry mostly foodstuffs, household goods and miscellaneous products, like salt. You have corn, you have a certain number of basic necessities on these trucks. On Monday, over 10,000 people made interest in bright yellow gathered for a climactic show in support of Zimbabwe's opposition leader Nelson Chamisa prior to 10th general elections. The southern African country goes to the polls on Wednesday for presidential legislative elections with Chamisa, 45, 45 years old, vying to defeat hardline 80-year-old head of state Emerson Nangagwa. The vote taking place against a backdrop of discontent at Zimbabwe's economic crisis is being closely watched as a barometer of popularity for the Sanu PF party in power since independence 43 years ago. Supporters of Shamisa Citizens Coalition for Change gathered on a parched plot of land in central Harare from where the Sanu PF's towering headquarters are visible. The rally was the finale to a bruising campaign in which Dozens of Chamisa's campaign meetings were banned and some of his supporters assaulted by suspected Sanu activists. The trial of the former Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Agustin Matataponyo, opened on Monday before the country's constitutional court. The former Prime Minister and opposition politician is accused of having embezzled $205 million of the $285 million disbursed by the Treasury as part of a pilot project. Former governor of the country's central bank, Leo Gratias Mutombo, and the South African businessman and manager of the company in charge of the project, Robler Cristo, are also being prosecuted in this case. On the other hand, presidential candidate in the upcoming December elections in consensing the legal proceedings, which he describes as a plot to damage his campaign. In South Africa, all is set in Johannesburg for the 15th BRICS Summit. The Santon Convention Center will host the leaders of the member states from Tuesday. In addition, representatives from 34 countries have confirmed their participation in the event. This is the first time that the leaders of this economic partnership have met face-to-face -face in the aftermath of the coronavirus pandemic. The Santon Convention Center, Johannesburg's main business venue, will host South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, Chinese leader Xi Jinping, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and Brazilian President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Russian President Vladimir Putin will participate in the meeting by video conference, but Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov will attend in his place. The broad agenda of the meeting includes the issue of de-dollarization and the prospects for the creation of a new common currency. So far, more than 20 nations have expressed their desire to join the bloc, while others have already formally applied for memberships. Thus, this issue of new members will also be on, ta on the table this time. The final day of the summit is expected to focus on talks with leaders of countries that do not belong to the bloc. In Angola, Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel and his counterpart Joao Lorenzo held official talks on Monday. During the meeting in Luanda, the Caribbean president extended to his counterpart the invitation to officially visit the island, as well as to attend the next summit of the Group of 77 and China to be held in Havana on September 15th and the 16th. The Cuban mandatory valued the fruitful meeting and confirmed the feeling of friendship and mutual trust that distinguished the bilateral ties. Miguel Diaz-Canel ratified the will of both parties to continue expanding on consolidating those relations in areas of mutual interest. The Cuban head of state arrived in Rwanda on Sunday, the first stop of his visit to Africa that includes Mozambique, Namibia and South Africa, the latter to participate in the upcoming BRICS summit. In this context, Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel held a meeting on Sunday night with a representation of more than 200 Cuban collaborators in Angola, where he recalled the historical roots of the friendship between the two nations. We are here out of solidarity. We are here out of solidarity since she and Neto met in the 65. And later on Neto met Fidel, and from that long history of friendship, there was also a crucial moment for the Angolan homeland. NATO asked Cuba to support them in the defense of the country, and it is true that the work of Cuba was heroic or epic. The Carlota operation, the battle that distinguished that epic as was Quito Guanabale, 
but it has also been very heroic what has been done in terms of cooperation based on the postulate of Fidel that we saw at the beginning of this meeting and that you are protagonist of this other stage that has also been epic. We have come to the end of this news program. You can find these and many other stories on our website, www.tresoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Tresor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.